On today's show, we walk the woods alongside a nature photographer who proves logical thinking and creative work make a winning combination. We celebrate fall in a Minnesota cranberry bog and the market where outdoor gear never dies. Minnesota Bound, presented by Connecticut Water Treatment Systems. Hey everybody, Laura and I welcome you to the show. Life of an outdoor photographer typically means camping out in the woods from sunup to sundown, doesn't it? Yep, for sure. Ron Shera tags along with photographer Joe Fierst. To capture a moment in nature, one has to take a moment or two, or maybe more. Joe Fierst has lots of moments. Obviously, you have to spend time outdoors to, to be in the right place at the right time. But, you know, there is a lot of luck involved being at outside when, when something's happening. Especially when you're in the flower and fauna business of nature photography. I uh, was in the military after high school and uh, saw some classes offered for photography through the the recreation center. The technical side of it made sense to me that being able to understand the exposure, figure out your composition and, and you know why, why are you picking this angle versus that angle and and uh, you know help me develop it as as more just uh, more than somebody who's clicking the, clicking the shutter. Joe's rather technical approach to snapping a shot makes sense. Proof is in the photograph. Joe's day doesn't begin in the woods, where you might expect. It begins here. I'm a you know, software developer. I've been programming computers for a long time. I'm able to sit down and think out logically what has to happen to get from where, what inputs, inputs we have. If I'm at work, I'm working. And you know, unless there's an owl calling out, it's like. <laughs> Back when I actually sat at a desk, I had a lot of photography around my cube, and and uh, you know, I, I would try to make sure people realize it was my pictures and not just you know corporate stuff off the you know off off the shelf type thing. Today, Joe has two offices, one with a computer for Ameriprise Financial, and the other with a camera out in Mother Nature. I mean, this time of year, late late October early November, I would think that if there's any deer around, they'll be a little more, less aware of the humans because they're, you know, the bucks will be um, looking for, for does. I'd like to think that, you know, there's two separate, you know, parts of the brain actually, because it's, you know, very logical and then, and the photography is more of an artistic thing, but, uh, you know, I've always, prided myself in, in being able to, to do both. And Joe uses both when searching for his favorite subject to photograph. Can you guess who it is? Currently, probably owls. Um, I've, I've uh, been chasing owls for quite a few years now um, and always have my ear open to, to when owls are being sighted. I'm always looking for tree cavities, see if, if they can find a, a roosting owl or something nesting in one of those to wait out the day until it's nighttime. Joe has chased owls in Yellowstone, the Tetons, the Badlands, and right here in Minnesota. There was one spot where they um, wanted roosted for several weeks in a row, so I was able to find pellets underneath where the, where the owl was sitting and you know, they were bolting and so there's feathers, you know, so all these other fun things that you can do besides just take a picture of the owl. Paying attention pays off. If you don't put yourself in, in the place for an opportunity, you'll never get it, so. Words to live by. Coming up, fall on the Cranberry Farm. We tag along as the autumn harvest gets underway. 
Minnesota Bound is brought to you by Connecticut Water Treatment Systems, North Dakota Tourism, Star Bank, and by Strike Master. Cranberries are definitely a tradition when it comes to Thanksgiving dinner. It turns out that cranberries are also a part of Minnesota's outdoor tradition too. Once a year, this sea of red appears in Minnesota, and only at one farm. I'm thinking there's probably two semi-loads there, so about 20 million berries in there. The Minnesota Cranberry Company remains the state's sole domestic cranberry producer. The cranberries grow, uh, grow good up here. 1,700 acres, family owned and operated by the foresters. We raise uh, cranberries uh, for ocean spray. There's only uh, 50 acres is really under uh, cranberries. Anybody that knows us knows that this is a family farm. We're doing what we love with the people we love. For 19 years, Randy and his wife Billy have fine-tuned the art of growing. He's doing what he loves to do every day of the of his life, so it's nice to see him very happy. I'm out here every day, but you know, basically my uh, my kids uh, are out here all the time. They're working, um, you know, my son and my daughters, and you know, they're out here. And my wife, if she comes out, and we're, we're you know trying to keep it going. My dad, his famous line is, "There always is a hundred things to do. There's never break time. Once it's time to for the crops to come off, they have to come off." Every September, wet harvest begins. Once we start, there's there's no stopping. It don't matter if it uh, rains, you know, wind, snow, we'll keep moving. Cranberries are one of three native berries in the U.S. Their vines rely on acidic soil, acidic water, and sand to thrive, all found in north central Minnesota. General rule of thumb is if uh, wild blueberries grow and uh, wild cranberries grow, uh, you can get uh, domestic cranberries to grow. Most of the time, uh, an upright will only produce four berries. Two berries is common. Once berries ripen, the foresters flood the bogs with six inches of water. As we put those six inches of water on, the berries actually pull the plant up out of the soil. Then, Randy and Nathan enjoy some father-son time on the Big Blue Beater, which gently knocks the berries off the vine. On some of those acres I show you, there's over 350 berries in a square foot. Interestingly, the berries float thanks to tiny pockets of air inside. And when them chambers all got air in, that's what hollow them, so keep, keep some full. Right now we're raising the water up. A, high enough to float them to one corner of the farm so we can uh, use a, our pump to, uh, to get them out and clean them. So we got roughly two million gallons of water sitting on this field right now. Corralling the berries requires all hands on deck and waiters too. They'll go into a, a fish pump. It'll, it'll, it's run by just water. It sucks them out of, the, out of the, the bog, run them through a cleaner, and uh, the good ones will go into the, into the semis. We had uh, eight semi-loads last year, and uh, now I think we're gonna probably gonna harvest probably uh, anywhere from 12 to 15 or 16 semi-loads. Approximately 10 million berries on that semi-load. Some of this harvest will become soda, beer, and wine, while the majority heads to Wisconsin for ocean spray juice and craisins. There's well over probably 50, 60 different products that are produced with cranberries one way or another. 900 berries to make this bottle of juice. There's a lot of hard work and pride bottled up in there, from the Forester farm to our table. I guess it means like everything to me. We all enjoy this and we wouldn't be here if we didn't. Hopefully it'll go to another generation and another generation and they keep, uh, keep farming up here. Still ahead, an oasis for all things old and outdoors. But first, a walk in the woods leads this recycler to a bright idea. Closed captioning provided by Treasure Island Resort and Casino.
Up next, a rare form of outdoor recycling. It's the bright idea of Sean Carling. Not to dive into the cliches, but if one man's trash becomes, well, you know. Sean Carling could be the king of collectors. I've always drug home things I shouldn't be dragging, dragging home. I asked my wife, you know, I used to go to auctions, I'd go to estate sales, I'd go to garage sales. All Sean's treasures end up here. So when you look around in the shop, I mean, I've picked all this stuff. Everything in here I've touched, everything in here I've found, everything in here I've dug out of a, a flea market. You know, we found it somewhere. I mean, there's so much fun stuff in here. And Sean, this one's, this one's probably one of my favorites. Becomes attached. You know, this reminds me of my dad. To darn near every piece. This is probably my, my favorite. These, th these are probably some of my favorites as well. I really like these. These are probably my favorites. This stuff is, is to me just super cool. What we do with it, I don't know. Oh, he knows. See, a few years back, Sean traded in his tech exec job to take Minnesota's tired junk and sort of shine new light on it. It's more of recycled, upcycled, you know, finding found objects and turning it into something fun. Like I said, he knows exactly what. The first time he did this, the light bulb clicked on. I was trying to figure out what to buy my dad for Christmas one year figured out what kind of a tractor we had on the farm and I sourced a piece from that tractor and turned it into a lamp for my dad, gave it to him for Christmas and everybody loved it. A one-time gift turned rather abruptly into full-time work. The art of light. This all started from a lamp I made for my dad and it seems only fitting that my dad should have to help as well. But my dad creates all the aviation stuff. My wife helps, you know, tremendously around the shop. My daughter's 16, so, you know, it's whatever I can get her over here to do. It's a family thing, and we have a great time with it. Sanding, coating, cleaning, wiring, we can all do that. Sean kind of puts most of the stuff together. He's the visionary. He's got all the ideas. Not true. But this is my idea. Lori Carling figured out how to get wires through the maze of pipes using the family's old vacuum. What I like to do is I like to take the iconic piece, the piece that everybody recognizes, and build it into something that's nostalgic, something that somebody remembers. Now the Carling's work goes to customers all over the world. Even so, Sean still loves the local crowd. The State Fair is pretty crazy. People watch it. What people say when they come into our booth, we, it, it ranges from the guy that says, oh, I could build this and, and uh, I could do it. The other one is, I wouldn't give 10 cents for this. And it's usually the older people that grew up around this stuff. The other one is they just love it. I mean, it's art to them and, and it's just cool pieces. It's taking heritage and recreating it into something functional and useful uh, for today. End up leaving Best Buy and, you know, good grief. I mean, it's a scary little thing to try and do, but uh, I mean, this is amazing. I mean, we've had a, we've had a blast with this. Building lights and lamps. And more importantly, recycling Minnesota's history one piece at a time. Although, by the looks of it, this is the front of an old, of a DC-9. Sean, better get back to work. So this is an old, probably 1920s water meter. He's got a lot of stuff to build on. This is the front of an old track, an old uh, steam locomotive. This would have probably been, been mounted to the side of an old train box car. I don't know what it'll become, but it's neat. Hey, don't forget, if there's something you missed, you can always re-watch our full episodes by subscribing to our YouTube channel. Minnesota Bound is brought to you by Radco Truck Accessories, Pearson Salted Nut Roll, and by Totem Resorts, the premier destination for world-class fishing.
It's time to buy, sell, and trade. Today we visit a Minnesota market where old things never die. Take a ticket. Welcome to a world where old stuff never dies. Heaven, if you're into vintage outdoor gear. It's a sickness. Once a year, one day only, the Medina Ballroom opens its doors to American sporting collectibles. The show is about the passion for the outdoors. There's something here for everybody. A place to sort of kick the tires and bend old rods, ducks, decoys, decorations, you name it. Concerning shoppers and buyers, dig it up. It's the romance. The hunt for something, however random. That should cover your ottoman, shouldn't it? More so than ever. And most of these guys are looking for in their 60s, trying to downsize. The last thing you need to go home is another two truckloads of new stuff. Exactly why Randy Havel wants to unload his stash. Is a hundred bucks going to do it for you? He lugged in three truckloads. You don't make any money. Now you have fun. Yeah, you turn in cash. That's what you do. Oh, there's more to it than that. Randy's been here all 20 years of the show. It's the hunt, the sale, and the memories. And this trap hung on the wall of our hunting camp up in Reamer, Minnesota, for about 25 years, and we figured we better sell it before somebody stole it. <laughs> Tim, good to see you. Yeah, you too. Every once in a while, it's a classic Mizra. A random piece of gear hits. Now look on the bottom of that. It's got the original price that they paid at the bait shop, dollar oh. seventy-five back in what, probably the nineteen sixties. What's what's that? What's that worth in today's market? Well, what let's say we got a price tag on it here, and we got it marked at two eighty-five. Uh, yep, two hundred and eighty-five dollars for a wood decoy that cost a dollar seventy-five back in the day. Same story with Jerry Kelm's work. Been making them since 1958. So I've been at it like, what, 58 years or whatever. And back then, they were selling for 25 cents a piece. Now I get up to, you know, into the hundreds for them. Buy, sell, appraise. Wally Wagleitner does all three. He also organizes the show. A lot of guys that come in, you know, and they're just looking for a couple old fishing lures that they can't find at your general sporting goods anymore. So this, this is uh, an old uh, fly rod that I acquired in the States. The other thing we do is we do free appraisals. The condition of it is, is impeccable. I mean, they come in if they don't know and they have their grandpa's tackle box or a sack of decoys, they can get kind of an insurance appraisal on it here and feel confident if they want to sell it in the future or perhaps pass it on to their kids. Probably it would date right back to about 1910, maybe even a little before. It's that old. It's in great shape. Today, that, in this show more than past, I've seen younger husband and wives and younger families coming through here. And... A sign of the times. New people hoping to make memories out of old stuff. We're the generation that uh, have a passion for this stuff, so we're here sharing the wealth. It's in the outdoors, that's what we're trying to perpetuate, and in the long run, preserve some of these artifacts. <laughs> My wife Katie gets all over me when I start buying that stuff. How much of it do you have in your house? Not much. <laughs> you? I love collecting petrified wood. That's really old stuff. I get that. <laughs> well, it's that time. We've come to the end of the show. We hope to see you back here next week. In the meantime, don't forget to introduce a kid to the great outdoors. Transportation provided by Premier Transportation. Call 1-800-899-7433.